All right, I think it's time and let's get started. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and I want to welcome you to this project briefing session in our spring 2020 virtual meeting. Shortly after we made the decision to take this meeting um, virtual, we issued an extraordinary call for additional session contributions, uh, which spoke to aspects of the uh, current crisis. Um, we felt that there was an opportunity um, in moving um, virtual uh, to be able to do that. Um, and that um, given the nature of the current crisis, uh, it would be um, very helpful to all of our uh, all of our um, members and participants to have that opportunity. This is the first session of those um, those additional supplementary project briefings, and um, I was really delighted uh, when we started getting those proposals in to see uh, one of the very first proposals was from Toby Green. Um, uh, I've known Toby a bit since his time at the OECD, and uh, I value him as a very incisive thinker. So. Um, I think we will all benefit from his thoughts on this. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, those will be moderated by Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI. Uh, there's a Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll use that to um, queue up questions. Feel free to put questions in there at any point, although we'll address them all at the end of the uh, session. And with that, um, thank you for being here, and I will turn it over to Toby. Welcome. Okay. Well, well, thank you, um, and thank you very much for uh, for uh, uh, having having me to uh, to give the first of of, of these presentations in uh, about uh, this 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 dreadful uh, uh, situation that we're all in. Um, I'm sitting um, somewhere north of Paris. Um, in, uh, in in a small hamlet, um, but as we as we're all locked down in France, um, and uh, but I'm still been working um, with, uh, with with my colleagues uh, on on a new project. Um, I've called this presentation event to a one. Uh, why weren't we paying attention? Um, but it's really a story um, about uh, about wild content. Um, now then, let's see if I can move forward. Here we go. Now, a little bit about me. If you don't know uh, who I am, Cliff mentioned that I work for the OECD. I, I, I certainly did for the last uh, two decades. Um, but I left the OECD uh, in, in August uh, last year to, to uh, help co-found uh, Coherent Digital. Um, previously, um, I, when I was in the UK, I worked for Oscar Science, and I've had positions such as the chair of the uh, of ALPSP. Now, you might wonder why, why Coherent Digital? Um, and uh, uh, if I may, I, I, I'd like to start with a story of, in fact, why Legionnaire's disease is, is so called. Um, the, the disease is named after the outbreak where it was um, first identified. And that was at a 1976 uh, American Legion convention in, in Philadelphia. Of the 2000 Legionnaires present, 182 contracted the disease and 29 died. Unlike COVID-19, Legionnaire's disease wasn't the result of a novel virus. It's now known that Legionella, a bacterium, causes uh, um, the, the disease, but it also causes another disease, in fact, the same disease called Pontiac fever, which was so named after a typical pneumonia outbreak among people who worked at and visited that city's health department in 1968. After the Philadelphia outbreak, the news about this new disease made lots of doctors realize that the atypical pneumonia they'd seen in care homes was probably Legionnaire's disease or Pontiac fever, take your pick. Now, what's the point of this little history lesson? Knowledge is often there in a sea of fog, if only we could see it. Back in 1985, I worked with a hill-walking whiskey connoisseur publisher by the name of Mike Buckingham. Mike um, heard about the story of doctors possibly recognizing Legionnaire's disease earlier 
and wondered how many other diseases could be identified sooner if there was a way to see into the fog that is doctor's case notes. Mike thought that if doctors could add these case notes to a database that could be searched, we might be able to see into the fog, an early attempt at crowdsourcing and data mining. Sadly, for a variety of reasons, mainly because it was 1985, we failed with that project. But I had learned a valuable lesson about fog. Having learned about digital publishing with Pergamon Press and then Elsevier, I left for France, my wife is French, and joined the OECD in 1998. What I found there was a parallel universe. A family of organizations, the OECD, the World Bank, the WHO, the United Nations, and the, and the like, all of which published independently uh, of the mainstream scholarly publishers. In print, this didn't matter. The print supply chain eventually got the books to university and other libraries, even if when they got there, they were often shelved separately from the mainstream content, which always used to irritate me. However, when it came to digital, being in a parallel universe mattered. As we've learned, in a digital world, scale and size is vital in the battle for attention and audience share. Self-publishing on your website is a recipe for self-isolation or leaving your content to take its chances in the fog of wild content that forms the bulk of the internet. It's not for nothing librarians call grey literature because you can't find anything grey in a fog. What to do? The choice was either to license the OECD's content exclusively to big players or aggregators who had the audiences that we sought, or compete from our own corner. We chose the latter. It wasn't a difficult choice. Our plan was to cheat the system. Our problem was this. Users were flocking to the big all-you-can-eat journal platforms and ignoring ebooks, largely because at the time there were no big all-you-can-eat ebook platforms, and the OECD mainly published books. On the basis that if you can't beat them, join them, we shoehorned our books, working papers, data sets, into a journal platform, which we called OECD iLibrary, and then we injected the metadata into the mainstream discovery and aggregation systems to drive discovery. If you capture metadata right, we learned, you can shapeshift it into pretty much any discovery channel. It worked. Dissemination of OECD's knowledge increased 40-fold. We won our fair share of that most, most vital thing, reader time. Except that I kept meeting publishers from smaller IGOs and NGOs who lamented that their publications went unread, unnoticed. Their publications were the droplets that formed an ever lar larger sea of fog and they didn't have the means to build their own iLibrary. I helped where I could by sharing the iLibrary platform with some IGOs, but the OECD isn't set up to be a publisher or aggregator, and for various reasons, including legal ones, I couldn't extend the invitation to NGOs or think tanks. Yet I know that IGOs and NGOs produce some really valuable content, knowledge that's unique and can make a difference, knowledge that can change policies and improve people's lives knowledge that's at risk because it's not archived anywhere. Knowledge that, if gathered into a database, could be mined. As you can see, I still haven't forgotten Mike's lesson about fog. We decided to call our company Coherent Digital because we know the tools that could help us meet this challenge are there, but they don't always work together. This is true not just of policy content, there's a lot of other wild content in the fog in blog posts, on websites, in shelves, in archives, in old CD-ROMs, and so on. So we're collaborating with libra librarians, technologists, publishers, and faculty to create a system that tames large bodies of content efficiently and speedily to make it cohesive, understandable, harmonious, coherent. And having started the story with one novel disease, I'm now going to tell you the story of another. Event 201, why weren't we paying attention? Last October, 15 business, government and health leaders met for a tabletop exercise in New York City called Event 201. 
they simulated an outbreak of a novel coronavirus that led to a severe pandemic. And you probably missed it. Well, as did most everybody else, unless, of course, you listen to big BBC Radio 5 Live at 2.30 in the morning or read the Nigerian Guardian. It really didn't get very far. Afterwards, the organisers, which include the Johns Hopkins Centre for Health Security in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, released the proceedings of the event. They released recommendations and, and, and six videos. Six days later, coincidentally, this appeared, ranked 195 countries pandemic preparedness, and it wasn't clickbait. It was in fact the launch of the 2019 and the first Global Health Security Index. And it was put out uh, again with the help of the Johns Hopkins um, unit um, and, uh, and, and and I forget the, the other um, organizers. They sought to eliminate pandemic preparedness at both national and international levels. And on their website, you can find visualizations, reports and data that tell you about the, pandem the pandemic preparedness of 195 countries. And here are six COVID-19 resources of which you probably are familiar with one, the Johns Hopkins chart up in the top left hand corner, but you may not be aware of the other five. The ones I particularly like is the Our World in Data's uh, uh, charts and commentary, which I think are incredibly illuminating. And, and I'm not being biased here, the OECD's country policy tracker, which will help you learn about how different countries' policies are evolving over time. Don't worry, you don't have to make notes. They're available all on our website, in fact, with three more that we found. Now, none of these resources are published formally. They have no identifiers. They're hard to cite. They're certainly difficult to find. They are at risk of link rot. Who's going to maintain these websites over time? They are wild content. And how many librarians and libraries capture this type of wild content in their catalogues? How many can connect this content with materials from the Spanish flu epidemic, which of course there are lessons to be drawn for today? And how many can include this content in their local discovery services? Now, Berkeley's Jim Church, who I know quite well, has of course always been keen on this content, and he's an expert on content from IGOs and NGOs. And this is what he said about IGO and NGO content back in 2009. NGO and IGO information is poorly documented, primarily digital, difficult to acquire, and in peril of digital demise. He also noted most NGOs lack the staff and financial resources to fund the publishing operation. And I concur, and um, that situation certainly hasn't got any better. Most of the NGOs and, and, and IGOs I'm still in touch with are struggling to maintain their staff and the financial resources to fund publishing because it's never a priority in those organisations. It's almost as if wild content doesn't want to be found. And I don't know how many of you might have been to Africa and have actually seen elephants in, in the bush. They're remarkably hard to find. Now, Clay Shirky, uh, who as a, was a web guru back in the noughties, is famous for saying that publishing is now a button. And in many ways, I know he's been very influential with a lot of people who work and a lot of communication people who work in IGOs and NGOs. And he said there's a button that says publish and when you press it, it's done. Well, let's check the source of that, shall we? Let's go to where that blog post, the blog post he made back in 2012. Well, yeah, right, Clay, it's done, isn't it? Well, that blog post has gone down. That content is now lost. As Kent Anderson put it, I used to write for CompuServe, but where is the CompuServe publishing button today? There are more IGOs and NGOs and think tanks than you may realise. According to the Union of International Associations, there are over 40,000 IGOs and NGOs, and they grow at about 1,200 a year. 
they're major knowledge creators. They're pu probably publishing something of the order of a quarter of a million reports a year, but no one actually knows. And on top of that, there's blog posts and data sets and videos and podcasts. And just to put that into perspective, there are twice as many IGOs and NGOs as there are universities worldwide. There's a huge amount of knowledge out there. Now, could we have moved faster on COVID? Have we stood on the shoulders of earlier giants? Back in New the, the, uh, this, this time around, the record in New York is not great. A hundred years ago, the death rate in New York, in fact, was lower than, than equivalent cities um, in, in the United States. And there are lessons to be, to be found in the old documents um, that were put out then, but they're really hard to find. Here's one document that I, I did find after a bit of effort, and it is in fact uh, recorded in WorldCat. It's the World Health Index, at least that's what the title says it, in WorldCat, and it's available um, from Ann Arbor. There's a link, and if you click on the link to the content, you get this, something called the Influenza Encyclopedia. And yet all you've got is the fact that it's the World Health Index. What it doesn't tell you is that this table shows weekly deaths from influenza by city in New York State between November 1918 and January 1919. None of that information is in the metadata. So if you're Googling for weekly deaths from influenza, you're never going to find that table sitting in uh, that archive. And it's not just about COVID. When I created um, coherent Digital, our focus at the time was on the sustainable development goals. We were looking at tax, we were looking at Brexit, we were looking at the trade, incre increasing trade tensions, we were looking at global warming, and we were looking at migration. All of these policy areas that are really critical uh, going forward, and all areas where IGOs and NGOs are producing a vast amount of knowledge. Clearly, there's valuable stuff in this content, whether modern or ancient. And what we need is a system that collects this stuff together and makes it visible in catalogues. We've got to capture this wild content. We've got to tame it so it becomes findable, useful and safe. We need a simple 21st century system that uses the cloud and the crowd because IGOs and NGOs are not about to invest anything in publishing. And it has to be a very simple system, a system that simply captures, circulates and catalogues the content. Now, you might have noticed that I've got some Frisbee sitting behind me and that's because I'm also a Frisbee player. So I'm going to use Disc Golf to introduce the Coherent Commons platform. First, we need to capture the content. So how? Well, we'll harvest, but also we'll enable manual upload onto our platform. And then we'll use AI tools to allocate an ID number, create a base record and store the item in the cloud. What happens next? Well, the item can be shared, embedded, cited, and the usage can be tracked by the content owner. It then goes into circulation. How? Well, via discovery services and search engines, via repositories, via our commons platforms, wherever the content happens to sit out there. And what happens next? Well, with what they know, users can fill in the blanks. They can add, add folksonomies, they can add stories, they can add links. And so the work gets catalogued. And its catalog is co-created by the crowd. And what happens next? The records are available for ingestion into library catalog systems and the item is saved with, of course, permission. And then it goes out to be circulated again and new users can add what they know, enriching the catalog entry further for new users and rinse and repeat. A simple 21st century system using the cloud and the crowd to tame wild content. So for example, our system would allow me to capture the content that's in this tape, in, in, in this bubble that I, I made, because I can read the table and I can extract that information myself 
and I can add it to the catalogue record. Think of it being like a 21st century library catalogue card, except that you never run out of space. And that, therefore that table will become more findable and more useful for the user. Now imagine all of that working at scale. And this is the major project that I've been working on for the last nine months. Imagine one and a half million items from IGOs and another million items from NGOs and think tanks all brought together into a single platform. Thousands of content items saved from defunct NGOs and think tanks because there are a lot of them out there that have ceased, uh, ceased to exist. Plus we're looking to license exclusive content from partners and from archives, bringing all of that content together into a single platform. And then we're going to add community tools, tools that will enable you to extract the data from tables, alerting systems, but also to allow members to meet other members and to upload their own content. So it's not just a, an aggregation platform, it's a community platform. And also institutions can upload their own content from projects and research groups and get usage and impact reports back so they can see uh, how well their content is doing. I'm going to go back to Jim Church again. He says that the level of student interest for IGO and NGO content around a wide variety of courses is intense. Well, we dug into that and we found that in syllabi, 25% of the links don't work. The links are broken because they're pointing to IGO and NGO websites that are not properly maintained. So we're going to keep a saved copy of everything we harvest with the permission of the copyright owner so that should the link break, we will have a copy to, to, uh, to, to, to deliver to the user. And if the link doesn't break, we will simply route the user back to the original website where they can find the content. Our goal is to make content findable, useful and impactful. So hopefully we can help speed up the policy process. It shocked us to discover that it took more than 100 years from the science warning about the dangers of asbestos to policy action. Maybe we can compress that by making the policy content easier to find and making it more useful. So what next? Well, right now we're capturing two and a half million records from 50 IGOs and NGOs. And we're adding persistent identifiers to all of them to create the basic catalog record and building the user experience, including obviously an awful lot of content relating to COVID. We're going to do a beta release in June, uh, towards the end of June. So I do invite you to join in and together let's lift the fog on IGO and NGO content. Thank you. So I'll be happy to take any questions now. Well, thank you, Toby. That was quite a fascinating presentation and lots to think about um, unleashing the wild content, harnessing the wild content, as you say, and making a massive amount of information available, accessible, and discoverable. Um, quite an undertaking and really fascinating. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions and invite our attendees to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Uh, the chat box is also open. And um, while we're waiting for folks to think about the presentation they just heard and formulate their questions, I just want to take an opportunity to remind everyone that this uh, webinar is part of the ongoing CNI Spring Virtual Conference uh, membership meeting. Uh, we are so delighted that you could take time out of your day to attend this webinar. And we want to let you know that there's plenty more to come. The meeting runs through the end of May. So we have several weeks more of really fascinating um, presentations to come. And I've just pasted into the chat box there. I've shared with you a direct link to the complete schedule for the remaining conference. And we still have one more webinar to go 
this afternoon, we'll have a presentation from uh, Rob Cortolano, Michelle Kimpton, and James English on Simply E and the academic ebook experience. Um, so please uh, check out what is to come yet in um, our remaining conference weeks. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I have a question, if I may, Toby, about um, your project. I'm wondering about funding and sustainability. Um, how is your project being, um, you're, you're looking at resources from entities that are known for, you know, working on very thin margins. Um, how, how is this project being funded, if you can speak to that? Sure. Well, the, the idea is that we're going to, um, as, is, as I said, harness all this content and, and bring it all into a single discovery service. And, and of course, a, a lot of this content is, is openly available on the original website. Users will come into our platform. It'll be free for anyone to do this. Discover, and then we will route them back to the original website from where they can then do the download. Now, if that content, if the link is broken, we will be able to serve up a copy that we've kept. That service will be available for our subscribers, our members. I see. Okay. Equally, we're looking at um, uh, licensing in some copy, some content, some backfile content in particular, um, content that has yet to be digitized. Mm -hmm or content that is sitting in the archives of um, IGOs and NGOs that, that, um, that, that could do with being, being made digitally available. Um, and, and that content uh, we will obviously include for our members um, for a, a period of time so that we can recoup the cost of capturing that content. And after that period of time, then the content can go open. So the funding will largely come uh, from, in a, in, a, in a way, commercial services that we're offering to, to the market. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a, a large amount of free service wrapped into here. And if, if, if those of you who, who, who know me from my OECD days will have heard me talking about freemium a lot. So in a way, we're creating a, a type of freemium uh, service here. Mm -hmm. And we have other ideas for, for, for monetization um, to help fund the work in terms of um, providing uh, usage data and intelligence about the impact of content back to the content owners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that should produce another, another revenue stream for us. So that's, um, th that, that's where we are. Really interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I just want to remind everyone also, or, or share with you, if this is your first time attending uh, one of CNI's webinars, uh, we do have the capability to turn on the microphone of attendees if you raise your virtual hand and would like to um, ask your question directly or engage uh, directly, make a statement. Um, please feel free to um, go ahead and raise your, your virtual hand and I can move you into a mode where your microphone is turned on. And again, uh, we invite you to type your questions into the Q&A box. I was also curious, Toby, about um, identifying the organizations that you are already, whose materials you're already ingesting into your system. How, how did that process happen? Well, um, obviously, with my, my, my network within, within the IGOs, it was relatively easy for me to, to go around all of the, the major IGOs, in fact, even some of the smaller IGOs um, that maybe you haven't heard of, um, to, to, to get their support for what, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that, that part was, was relatively straightforward. With the NGOs, now, I, I knew a lot of the NGOs, but um, together with, with Jenna Makowski, who's the editor I've got working on this project, we've been researching um, the, the NGOs um, and working with, with picking off, to begin with, obviously, some of the larger ones, but we're also looking um, at, at, at other areas. I mean, for example, um, the European Parliament Research Service, they produce an enormous amount of really valuable content. Mm -hmm. that, that no one really knows exists. Um, so we've been working with, with people like that to, 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 to get them 
to to cooperate with us in terms of supplying the content, um, so that we can um, we can really produce a service that is is really quite unique in terms of its scale and and its breadth. Yes, indeed, and um, so much fascinating information just left untapped there as well. Well, I, I want to thank you again, Toby, for coming to CNI to uh, present your really interesting work. And I see that we actually do have a question right now. And let me share that with you. Uh, the question is, what criteria do you have in terms of what contents to include for your project? Okay, um, well, we're looking at uh, content that, that to use a, a bit of OCD jargon um, would be substantive. Um, by that, um, we, we want content that's got some meat in it. We don't want communication content. Um, so we don't want what I call, you know, it's brochureware, sort of the, the, the bits, and, bits and bobs that organizations put out that, that, that describe what they're doing or, or, or try to convince in, t in terms of how wonderful they are. So we're looking at, at, uh, at content that actually has some, some, some substance in it. But we're looking very broadly. Um, so we're looking at blog posts, we're looking at tweets, we're looking at podcasts, we're looking at videos, we're looking at reports, we're looking at web pages, we're looking at data sets. Um, the variety of content types that these organizations put, put out is huge. And so we're, we're being completely agnostic in terms of the file format. Um, what we're really after is making sure that we can, we can capture what is useful um, and make that available. Rather than selecting at the basis of each content item, and plainly we can't do that, not if we're harvesting two and a half million items, what we're doing is we're selecting at the level of the institution. So we're, we're, you know, we're working and looking at you know, particular IGOs and particular NGOs to see whether they fit um, what, we're, what we're trying to do. Um, and within the policy um, space that, that, we've, that we've identified, um, you know, there are some IGOs that don't fit. The World Meteorological Organization, for example, um, they publish science. There's no policy content in, in this, there at all. It's just, it's really, really hard science about, about, uh, about weather systems. Um, so we're, you know, we, we, we won't be including that type of content. We're looking at content that, that really addresses policy issues um, and, and the organizations that, that are in that space. Interesting. Uh, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. And we still have some time for more questions. If anybody would like to um, type in a question for Toby, or if you would like to make a comment or engage directly, feel free to raise your hand. And again, this is part of CNI's Spring 2020 virtual conference ongoing until the end of May. We're really grateful to Toby for coming to CNI to chat with us a bit about his project. About can, can, I, can I post a, uh, pose a question to the audience? Um, how, many, how many of you think that you would like to, uh, to, to join us as we launch this, this uh, platform and get involved in some testing? Um, because we really want to make sure that, the, that we get feedback from, we've already been talking to an awful lot of librarians and a lot of faculty about um, what we're doing, but when we actually come to roll out the, the platform, um, we really want to get people involved in, in, in testing to make sure that it is delivering what, uh, what's needed. So how many of you do you think, maybe, is there a way you can put your hands up um, to, to, uh, to, 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 to show interest in, in getting involved in testing? We have uh, several hands raised there. I don't know if you can see Toby in the um, attendee box. We've got uh, four or five hands going up there. Um, we also have a comment. And if you want to uh, make a comment about Toby's question, uh, feel free to type that in the chat box. Um, let's see, we have five hands raised and here's a couple of comments. Um, let's see, one comment. Wonderful and important work, and thanks for sharing. Interested in the platform, how will CD treat embargoed or uh, not open to the public content? Will there be a way to know of existence of some of this content, even if it's not readily available to the public? Uh, well, we're, we're currently um, 
I mean, at the moment, obviously, we're, we're getting feeds from some organizations and we're harvesting off public websites for the bulk of the content. Um, now, for example, with the OECD, um, we're going to get a feed from their, their, uh, their, their, their system. And, and I know, because I built it, um, that their system has um, the details about embargo content in the feed. So for them, yes, we will be able to 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 share the the uh, the forthcoming titles and and the embargo dates, um, but it's really going to depend on on the feed that we get um, as to whether we're going to be able to to do that. Now I have to say, from my knowledge of most international organisations' uh, content management systems, they don't really have that ability uh, to feed in advance uh, embargo dates. Um, so I'd be surprised if we're really able to, to do that at scale. I think we're going to be able to do that in a few cases. Now, plainly, if the content is, um, imagine if the content is sitting behind someone's paywall, which could exist. Um, we will know of that content inside uh, Policy Commons, so people will be able to, to discover it inside Policy Commons. And when we hand that user back to uh, the original website, that's when whatever access control system they have will kick in. Um, and so therefore, yes, you'll be able to discover the content, but your access rights will be dependent on whether you have subscription rights or, or password rights or whatever, whatever, whatever wall that, 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 that that organization is using. That, okay. Then, and, and Boaz, uh, that, that question was from Boaz who said uh, to you, got it. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of other comments here. Um, I'm not quite sure what my availability will be with this COVID-19 quarantine stuff, but I would potentially be interested. And we have an email address there, which I'll share with you later. Thank you for your work, that commenter says. I'm at the University of California, where I bet folks may already be involved. I will share about this with my colleagues in special collections and government documents. Um, and yes, so we have some interest definitely in this project. Are you frozen? And I'm sorry, can you see me? Toby, did we lose you? Well, I'm afraid we may have lost Toby <laughs> and I am sorry for that. Um, but I will um, extend my thanks to Toby for coming to CNI and presenting about this marvelous content and his wonderful project. Thanks to all of our attendees. We hope to see you back at other webinars throughout the meeting. Take care, be well, and bye-bye.